You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. This is Ray Sobs from the NX Network, and you're listening to Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on the X. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Shifts channel and on the X, the new mainstream KUNX digital broadcasting talk radio. Are you ready for this? Because we are about to embark on an hour and a half of UFO shenanigans and paranormal adventures. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red TikTok instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality of the UFO mystery. All of these shows are great primers. And in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. Let's get into some unusual news from this last week. March 13th was the 25th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights incident. That's pretty exciting. And there's a conference this coming weekend dedicated to the event. For those that may not know about the Phoenix Lights, on March 13th, 1997, a boomerang-shaped craft with orbs traveled southeast from Nevada across Prescott, Arizona, and into Metro Phoenix, continuing to Tucson and southeastern Arizona before heading into Mexico at 10.30 p.m. It has been classified as one of the largest and best-known UFO sites sightings in history. And that's down to the sheer number of people who witnessed it. As many as 10% of Arizonans, according to a Rocky Mountain poll at the time back in 1997. A big reason why so many people saw this craft was because the majority of them were out to witness the hale Bop comet that can be witnessed only once in a lifetime. So who knew they were in for a good show of seeing more than just a comet? Some witnesses stated that the boomerang-shaped craft was several football fields long and completely silent while hovering over the city. Some people recorded the scene on their video recorders, which at this time were not of the best quality. But even after this mass sighting and video footage, it was quickly swept under the rug. The explanation given by government officials claimed the orbs seen were nothing more than flares deployed as part of a military training exercise. The V-shaped craft was explained away as a series of planes flying in formation. It was soon after emphasized by then Arizona State Governor Fife Symington that this was an incident to brush off. He believed that in order to relieve stress by these panicked citizens was to make a big joke about dressing his chief of staff in an alien costume, stating, let's look upon the guilty party. And after some laughs were exchanged at the news conference, he then said, this just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. There was more laughter, and then he unzipped the costume. People could see the chief of staff and continued to chuckle at their little stunt. 
Later on, Fife admitted that he too saw the lights that night, but believed what he did while in office in 1997 was the right thing to do to remove the tension that so many people had. Now, did he do the right thing? Well, that's up to your own discretion. Regardless, we need that kind of event to happen again. Now we have such better quality cell phones that can record videos. We have social media and we have the basic knowledge that we are aware that we're not alone in this universe. If this were to happen again, let's say this year, it would go viral in minutes more so than compared to the late 90s due to the things that I had just mentioned. That would be so exciting for so many people. But imagine if you missed the sighting by just a few minutes of who knows the reason. I mean, I would be heartbroken if I were to miss an event as big as the Phoenix Lights if it were to happen in my backyard. Outphoria conducted a study, which is a website dedicated to appreciating the outdoors, to see which state had the most UFO sightings. The study said that Arizona ranks fourth in the country, and this information was based on the National UFO Reporting Center. Yet I have come across other studies that proclaim that Arizona is the number one state with the most sightings, but needless to say... Arizona has a high percentage of UFO sightings and a place that UFO researchers and enthusiasts should visit. In other news, drilling deep down into the Earth's surface is a particularly challenging feat. To date, the furthest anyone has gone is around 7.6 miles. That doesn't sound like much, but the problem lies in the fact that operating a drill at extreme depths and pressure is very difficult. But since 2020, a pioneering energy company called Quace has attracted some serious attention for its audacious goal of diving further into Earth's crust than anybody has dug before. They have now raised a total of about $63 million. By 2028, the company hopes to be able to take over old coal-fueled power stations, transforming them into facilities powered by steam instead by drilling into the Earth. They are wanting to create or harness geothermal energy to help our planet diverge from coal and gas. So let's see what happens. Switching to some more spooky news, Military.com interviewed a retired DIA intelligence officer and retired CIA operations officer who claimed they saw a werewolf on Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. Between 2008 through 2010, James Lekatsky and Jim Senevin ran a UFO program funded by the Pentagon. According to Lekatsky and Senevin, the men who were sent to investigate the ranch were left terrified after they witnessed what was described as a black void on the property. Even more unnerving was the fact that they also reported experiencing paranormal phenomena after returning to their homes, such as strange noises and sightings of dark figures at night. In a separate incident, the investigator reported witnessing a wolf-like creature, which walked on two hind legs, staring through the windows of their home on two occasions. When asked about them, however, the Pentagon was unable to confirm or deny that any of these investigations and encounters took place at Skinwalker Ranch. Now with the news out of the way, let me talk about my guest. Pete McCarthy is a returning guest on Shifting the Paradigm. He is a YouTuber and podcaster who is a master of mystery and tales of the unknown, the unusual, and the unexpected. A student of the UFO mythology and a dedicated researcher into ancient mysteries, he has invested decades into probing the unknown and unexpected. He is the host of Creepy Little Book, a show 
with a focus on the fringe. Everything from the esoteric to the extraterrestrial, the spiritual to the supernatural, and all that lies in between. Pete, welcome once again to Shifting the Paradigm. How are you? Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Christina. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. And when it comes to mythology, ancient stories, and the occult, that's all kind of your thing. You have been on the show before where the audience and myself really got to know you and how you got interested into all of this. So today we'll be covering a lot of different topics of the things that you have looked into. And you are such a fantastic storyteller. So let's get into it. You ready? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So recently, you talked about Cthulhu on your YouTube channel titled Creepy Little Book. How did this myth come about, and who is this infamous Cthulhu? Well, this Cthulhu mythos actually was the product of Howard Phillips Lovecraft. He was an author who lived uh, about 100 years ago. Very different time. Uh, Lovecraft gets a lot of flack in the modern era for some of his views on uh, race, uh, which are very outdated. But uh, I don't, I'm able to separate the art from the artist personally. And I think that his work really stands by itself, a testament to his twisted imagination and his ability to conjure up these cosmic horrors. You know, I even speculate that perhaps he was a little bit like Edgar Cayce. Maybe he was in communication with something out there in the void that was sending him messages. Who knows? And can you go into a little bit more detail about Mr. Lovecraft? Like, how was he able to conjure up all of these spectacular stories? Well, Lovecraft was in a, a writing circle with uh, several other authors, and most prominent being uh, Howard uh, uh, Robert E. Howard, who wrote Conan. And he was corresponding with other contemporary writers at the time, so they were kind of building this mythos together, a, a couple of them. August Derleth was uh, another contributor to the Cthulhu mythos, who wrote several stories that expanded upon what Lovecraft had built. And there were other authors that would come even up until this modern era. And of course, there's tons of fan fiction, there's lots of games uh, centered around the Cthulhu mythos. It essentially boils down to the idea that the universe is cold and unforgiving populated by ancient cosmic gods who are completely indifferent to the suffering of humanity. And at the center of all this is a strange character called Azathoth, the blind idiot god who created the universe. And he's surrounded by demons who pipe and drum and, and play this strange dissonant music that one could barely even imagine at this point uh, that uh, continually goes on at the center of the universe. But there are others that populate this world, like uh, uh, Narothotep, which is one of my favorite stories, which was based on uh, Nikolai Tesla. None other than the great inventor Nikolai Tesla, Narothotep was based upon. And uh, this is the story of a man who comes out of ancient Egypt and uh, starts doing lectures on electricity, building strange contraptions and, and luring people into his lectures. And then when they leave them, they find themselves changed. They find the world around them altered in a strange, bizarre way. Narothotep, they bowed before him, but they didn't know why. This is one of my favorite lines from the story. The, uh, the, the people bowed before him, but they knew not why. So when it comes to this myth or this story of Cthulhu, is it just merely a creature that or a story that's trying to teach us something? Is it based off of a real creature? And do you think maybe something like this octopus type monster is still living in our waters today? I'd love to believe that Lovecraft was onto something real, you know, that there was this connection that he had with some cosmic darkness, some, some intelligence out there in the void of space. But at the end of the day, it's fiction. You know, I mean, this was the product of someone's imagination. Uh, and, and it's been built up so much over the years that it, it has taken on a life of its own. If you've ever read the Simon Necronomicon that was published in the seventies, that's heavily influenced by the work of Lovecraft, everything down to the proposed author of the book, the ancient Assyrian magics that are contained wherein have been rewritten to include Cthulhu deities and the different characters from the mythos. So uh, it, it has been incorporated into the occult. And, and there are some that I would say would actually attempt to manifest some of these creatures 
in uh, ritual ways for different purposes, looking at them as archetypes rather than as actual demonic entities. Can you go a little bit more into detail on that? Um, how are you able to conjure up a creature that I guess for many believe that doesn't really exist? Well, I, I, that would kind of lead into the idea of like a tulpa or a thought form. Uh, you're not limited into what you can conjure when it comes to the occult. You can create your own entities called tulpas. Uh, these are thought forms. They exist outside of the tulpa mancer. They are uh, essentially a non-human intelligence. So uh, how does one conjure something that may or may not exist uh, it's, it's a matter of will and belief. I think, I think it's really, if you're firm in your belief, if your will is strong, uh, then perhaps you can achieve what the, you know, the magician has attempted to achieve since time immemorial. That's conjurings and invocations, various rituals to communicate with spirits. You know, it goes back, it goes way back. I mean, we talk about guys like Edward Kelly and John D who were necromancing to talk to the angels. They translated an entire angelic language called Anakian script. You know, uh, even back to the Bible with the witch of Endor who conjures up the ghost of Samuel so that Saul can speak to him. So uh, some strange stuff. But it's all, it's it's in there and it goes back a long way. Some of the concepts in the Cthulhu mythos stories seem to have links to mythical gods in ancient cultures. Do you think Lovecraft was a researcher of those things? I think to an extent. I, I think to an extent he dabbled in the research to lend credibility to his stories. But I can't imagine he was someone who was pouring over hardcore research to kind of fill in the details. A lot of his work was created in a fictional New England town. So, like, when we talk about Arkham, uh, you know, the first thing I say when I, when I say Arkham, the first thing people are going to think is probably Batman because of the asylum. But that came from the works of Lovecraft. He created a fictional New England town where he set a lot of his stories in. And he would, he, he, you know, collect, connect uh, his stories together through these various fictional towns that he created throughout New England. Um so he wasn't even setting his stories in actual places that were real to begin with. Uh, so in that regard, you know, uh, it, it is a matter of, of artistic expression, I think, rather more so than an extension of his research. Are there any other myths that resemble this creature? Other writers expanded on the mythos with stories of the Windwalker, a.k.a. the Windigo, and the Nyarlathotep, the psychic god from Egypt. What do you think? I don't necessarily draw any lines back to any existing mythology. I mean, with Cthulhu, the closest thing we've got to that is the Kraken. You know, obviously we've got this, you know, giant squid that may exist out there in the ocean, and they prove this giant squid exists. Uh, but the Cthulhu himself is kind of an amalgamation of a humanoid figure and a dragon and an octopus. He's got these rudimentary wings. Um, so I can't say with any definitive proof that there's some god or deity out there from ancient times that could match up to this. And if there was, that would be pretty scary if it was discovered, you know, at any point between now and, you know, the future, if something like this was dug up. And it did resemble Cthulhu, and it did kind of lend something to the mythos. That would uh, that would open up some strange doors, some strange doors. But I don't think that's the case. I guess that's kind of the thrill when you're reading stories or myths is that belief of like, what if, what if this creature, this monster really did live among us. Now, going from Lovecraft mythology to Cajun mythology from the state of Louisiana, you get some nice jambalaya, some beignets, and a good Rougarou story. What is That's the right. Rougarou? Is, is it the same as the Cajun Sasquatch and um, Honey Island Swap Monsters or what? Uh, the Rougarou is a werewolf. The Rougarou is the Cajun werewolf, the beast of the bayou. And uh, the Rougarou is a is kind of a curse that you bring upon yourself by not observing Lent for seven years in a row. This curse is tied into religious beliefs. So the, uh, the idea is that you become cursed with this werewolf curse. You change into the wolf at night. 
Uh, and until you draw, until someone draws blood from you, you're saddled with the curse. I think it's either 110 days or until somebody draws blood before the curse runs off or you pass it on. Uh, some it's, it's, it's vague. It's vague, and the stories are different. Even the names of the creature are different. You know, you got the Rougarou, the Loop Guru, uh, because it comes from the French. And uh, the Rougarou is not only uh, something you would hear. Well, you would hear Loop Guru in Canada. Because they would refer to the werewolf up there as well the same way. But the Rougarou is essentially, for lack of any better explanation, a werewolf. And uh, and a fairly modern interpretation of the werewolf as well. I mean, we're talking about around the time of Marie Laveau, people would have still believed in the Rougarou. There's still a Rougarou festival they hold every year to this day. Which I'd love to attend. Well, let's talk a little bit about werewolves. What are they? How are they created? Uh, I guess when I mean created, I mean in the sense of our mythology. How did it all come about? Well, werewolves are old. You got to remember they were hunting werewolves the same way they were hunting witches hundreds of years ago. So uh, in some cases, the werewolf made a pact with the devil. In other cases, the werewolf had a special belt or an ointment that they would put on. And this would facilitate the transformation into the animal. But lycanthropy goes all the way back to ancient Greece with King Lycon, who was turned into a wolf for killing children by Zeus. That was his punishment. So the werewolf is very ancient. It crosses through cultures. It's not something that's just limited to European culture. I mean, the Greeks had it to begin with. Um, so you do see, and so you do see some variations of it in uh, Mesopotamian religions and, and myths. Uh, where people do transform into animals. The idea of shape-shifting is replete around the world. But the werewolf, significantly, uh, there were trials. A lot of people were executed for werewolf crimes. Uh, Peter Straub is one of the most famous werewolves. He was a mass murderer. And in a lot of these cases, these people were mur just murderers. You know, they were senselessly killing. Now, in some cases, there were actual wolf attacks, like the Beast of Gen Vudan. Uh, that was a very famous one that killed over 500 people. But this was not a werewolf. But you can see the werewolf was so feared because the wolf was so feared. The European wolves were very aggressive. There's a story that comes from Paris for the winter of like 1457, where the walls of Paris were destroyed after 100 years of war. So the wolves were able to get in. And the people of Paris had, uh, they were going through a famine. They had stripped the countryside of most of the food. They had hunted most of the game. So the wolves had nothing to eat. So the wolves come in through the city gates and they ravaged the city of Paris. I mean, they attacked a hundred people. This was a giant wolf pack led by a wolf they called Bobtail. And this was a huge problem for Paris at the time. But you can see how stories of real wolf attacks would inspire the fear that one would have of a werewolf, that somebody could be walking amongst you during the day in the shape of a man, and then at night committing these horrible attacks that were so common in this era. Changing gears a bit, something that's on a lot of people's mind is a world war, a war to end all wars, maybe being started right now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and all the world leaders posturing with sanctions and seizures. You researched how a final nuclear war may be coming several years ago and did so again a few weeks ago uh, about the end times. The end times and prophecy are mentioned in many religions. So from your research on the topic and one who is knowledgeable with the Bible scriptures, what can you tell us about the end times? Well, a lot of people are very concerned we're living in the end times now. There's actually a traditionalist Catholic prophecy, not a normal mainline Roman Catholic, but traditionalist Catholic prophecy that goes back some ways that talks about this. Uh, and, and there is most famously the story of Our Lady of Fatima, a Marian apparition that occurred in 1917 in Fatima, Portugal. Now, uh, according to this apparition, the, uh, there were three secrets that were given to these shepherd children that were uh, straight from heaven. One was a vision of hell that the children saw. They saw millions of people tumbling headlong into hell, and this terrified them. Uh, another one of these secrets was that Russia must be consecrated to the sacred heart, I'm sorry, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, or it would spread its errors around the world and many nations would be destroyed. 
Now, uh, a lot of people are looking to the secret of Fatima now and saying, is this what we're living through? Is this what's happening? Are we heading up towards the end times because Russia is now making its move? Even in evangelical circles, there's a lot of eyes towards Russia in end times prophecy. There's a lot of belief Russia will be integral in this, like, moving forward in this great war that's to come. Personally, eschatology fascinates me, whether it's the study of the end times from a Christian perspective or a Zoroastrian perspective. Whether it's Hopi prophecy of the new Kachina, of the blue Kachina or, you know, uh, or any various uh, religious take on the end of time, I find it all fascinating. Personally, I believe that it's impossible to gauge when the end of time will come. You know, I don't think anybody really knows. It could be in an instant. It could be in a million years. We're not sure. Eventually, the sun will grow and it consume the earth. Who knows if we'll still be here then? We might have, you know, traveled to stars at this point in the future. But, you know, we could be all wiped out in a nuclear war next week as far as we know. I think the best thing to do is just keep on keeping on. So uh, anything that I would uh, lay out as saying, okay, these events have come to pass would be just interpretation of prophecy. And that's all that people do. They interpret prophecy. That's all we can do is attempt to interpret what these prophets were telling us in ancient times. So one of the big ones is the reestablishment of Israel as a country in 1948. This is a huge aspect of prophecy. So um, it, does that mean that we're moving forward in this direction of a prophetic time? Maybe it does. Maybe indeed we are. So when it comes down to it, are the signs there? Was the Revelation 12 sign something that occurred in the sky a few years back, you know, with the alignments of Virgo, with, Dra with the constellation of Draco, uh, the birthing of Venus through this various constellation? Was this a sign? Was this something that comes straight from the book of Revelation? Maybe. But I tend to think of the book of Revelation and its symbols and signs as being much more dramatic than simple constellations aligning. You know, I, I, I tend to believe that if the events were to come to pass as they are described in this book, which is essentially written like a fever dream. I mean, Patmos was the island where John, the author of this book, was exiled to. So this guy was all alone, exiled on an island. Who knows what was going through his head when he wrote this stuff down? But, I mean, it is sobering material and it is written like a fever dream we're talking about beasts coming up out of the oceans monsters rising up out of the ground the resurrection of the dead walking the earth again i mean it, it is pretty far flung stuff when you think about it but you know uh, socio-political movements and wars and rumors of wars these things are par for the course you know, it's been this way since the Cold War, and I'm sure the people believe they were living through the end times back in World War II. So where are we now? I'd say that we're in a sticky situation globally. Hopefully it plays itself out with at least the least amount of death and destruction possible. But are we there in the end times? Are the signs there? I would say maybe. I would say maybe. Based on the research that I've done, maybe we are. It's a scary thought, sobering thing, and especially, you know, having children the way I do. I mean, I don't want to think it's the end of time. You know, I hope there's a bright future ahead for them. But I think we all need to work together to ensure that future uh, rather than just kind of hope for the best at the end of the day. Alternative talk you can trust. The X. Howdy folks, this is Lou Elizondo and you are listening to my very good friend Christina Gomez on Shifting the Paradigm. Hi, I'm Micah Hanks and let me tell you something, I support Christina Gomez as a Patreon subscriber and here's why you should too. She brings all of her unique insights to a whole new generation and all while she's also going through college. Listen, support Christina, become a Patreon subscriber today. You won't regret it. Hey there, it's Christina. 
Did you know you can get access to an exclusive extra segment of additional questions and answers with all of my guests, as well as behind the scene videos and photos? Ever wonder how I turn my small college dorm apartment into a studio where I can shoot new videos or set up lighting and backdrops for my show or what camera I use? Yep, that video is there too, where I explain as I go along and also give the story of how I learned to do special video effects and editing. You can get access to all of that and much more by joining my Patreon supporters club. You'll be helping by supporting this channel, my research, and production costs, as well as investing in new shows coming soon. Starting from as little as $5 a month, there are several tiers you can choose from that suit your budget, and each tier carries extra perks and benefits. Join my Patreon club and become a supporter today. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Gold loves chaos uncertainty and disarray history shows us what gold does when people aren't sure aren't sure about the government the stock market their jobs or their retirement savings our national debt is skyrocketing gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover so what can you do right now to protect yourself call united gold group we offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours are you worried about the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. You're listening to the UNX Network, KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. What is that? A deer? I can't tell. Is that a bear? Wait, is that a person? At night, your vision drastically changes. Imagine thermal imaging and the ability to see clearly up to 1,000 yards at night. That ability is a reality with AGM Global Vision, offering high-quality thermal and night vision optics. Get crisp and clear images that are Wi-Fi compatible, recordable, and storable. AGM Global Vision has an extensive range of quality-made rifle scopes, clip-on systems, spotting scopes, binoculars, goggles, lasers, and infrared illumination. Get the edge at night with crystal clear sight. Call 928. 928- 333-4300 or visit agmglobalvision.com Use promo code TSL and get 10% off. That's agmglobalvision.com This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Welcome back. With me today is Pete from Creepy Little Book. We were just talking about the end times and prophecies. Do the prophecies of the end times have anything to do with the actions or interventions of demons? The study of demons, known as demonology, mentions their evil intentions manipulating events that lead up into the end times. What do you think about this? Well, there is a story that comes to us again from traditionalist Catholic prophecy of something called the Great Chastisement. And this is just really, this is not biblical. It's not in the Bible. Um, there's, there's no impetus for anybody who is even, even a practicing Catholic to believe this particular prophecy. But this story comes from, I believe, the Marian apparition in La Salette, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, as this story goes, there will be a great chastisement where everyone will feel the weight of their sin. This will be a supernatural event that will occur 
Um, before this chastisement comes, there'll be an opportunity for repentance. But there will be this great chastisement. It'll be this supernatural event that occurs in the world. There will be no explanation for it. They won't be able to get on the news and explain it away. It will be something supernatural that occurs to the planet. Not the end times, but a punishment. So whether or not we're living through that, I don't know. And, and whether or not that's to occur, maybe not. Um, but uh, when, we, when we get down into the various different prophecies, uh, I've always kind of liked the Zoroastrian aspect of it. Zoroastrians have a very unique eschatology. And parallels to Christianity can be found within it. You know, um, very much can be said for Islam when they uh, when you examine their eschatology and their end times beliefs. There are also parallels that can be found in the book of Revelation and Christianity. So whether or not these influences are based solely on the fact that we're talking about monotheistic religions. And of course, there is the influence from one to the other down through the ages or perhaps divine inspiration is correct on all three counts. I don't know. But uh, for Zoroastrians, they believe that there will be three monsters that show up at the end of time. Uh, in the Bible, it's uh, you know similar. You have your your first beast, your uh, your wounded beast, and your your false prophet. You know the Antichrist and the false prophet and the beast. In uh, in Zoroastrian belief systems, there are three monsters as well. But each is slayed by the combined forces of humanity and their leader, who is a messianic figure called the Shoyoshant. And in history, there will be three Shoyoshants and three monsters. So uh, their end times belief moves in a three-fold cyclical kind of way. The first monster appears, the Shoyoshant is born, the Shoyoshant leads the people of Earth against the monster, and they defeat it. The monster, though defeated, is not dead and comes back in another form, in another time. Another Shoyoshant is born, he leads the people of Earth again against this monster, who then they defeat. Uh, this happens a third time when the monster is finally defeated. At this point, the world is flooded in molten metal. For the pure of heart, this will feel like a bath of warm milk. But for those who have sin in their soul, this will be a purification. This is the final purification before all are born to a new world of peace and love. Uh, I really study Zoroastrianism deeply. I find it a very fascinating religion. Its end times beliefs are unique uh, in that there, there, there is a hell for those who face death, but it is not an eternal place of punishment. It is a temporary place of punishment and purification. So uh, for the Zoroastrian, when you die, you cross this bridge, a very narrow bridge. And if you're sinful, you fall off into hell. If not, you make it across into heaven. But at the end of time, everybody gets into heaven because they're all purified and, and, and punished enough. So it's so, a so comforting thought, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. Those stories of forgiveness are powerful. No matter how evil you were or the wrong deeds that you did, in the end, you will be forgiven. This is the kind of the understanding I'm getting from what you just mentioned. And I think that does give people a lot of hope, especially right now where many people believe that we are entering the end times period. But you're right, we simply don't know the actual signs of the end times. So in your opinion, are demons real as in entities from a demonic realm that sometimes are able to gain limited access to our mortal realm? Well, I would agree with that. They, they, they exist. I do believe they exist. <clears throat> and uh, I don't think that they come from a demonic realm. I think they're right here on Earth. I think they're, you know, like ultra terrestrials in a way. They don't have bodies. They never did live you know, they don't possess life. But they are non-corporeal and they are non-human intelligences. And they do exist. I think they do exist based on the fact, not only uh, from my own religious perspective and my own faith, but from examining different cultures from around the world. And, uh, you know, it's not limited to monotheistic religions. Demons exist in all pagan religions. They have existed in cultures around the world and since the dawn of time. I find it very strange <clears throat> that people would conjure up this idea all around the globe in the earliest days of civilization 
without there being some kind of reason for it. So I do believe these demons do exist. I've, I've, I've got books on demonology. I think there's a hierarchy of demons. I think there's a lot of work done very well in the medieval era concerning angelology and demonology, especially from the Jewish and Christian perspective, where they were able to outline an entire hierarchy of these things, where you can see how they relate to one, one another. They're, um, the Goeta, 72 demons of the Goeta is, is a good one to get with uh, if you're interested in that. You know, the sigils and the symbols of these creatures. The uh, Dictionary Infernium has excellent illustrations of these creatures. But they definitely exist. They definitely exist. Some are mentioned by name in scripture. Apollyon, the beast of the pit, you know, the angel over the pit. He's uh, he's mentioned in scripture. You know, and sometimes it's not clear whether the line is embarked uh, in one direction or the other. Are we talking about an angel or a demon? You know, is the angel of death demonic in nature? I don't know. But, uh, but there could be something to that. That's a very interesting question. Is the angel of death demonic or have some type of demonic characteristics? That really shifted my paradigm right there. What can you tell us about angelology? Because you mentioned a little bit earlier and that oh, yeah. caught my attention. Well, the study of the angels is just as deep and as rich as the study of the demons. Maybe even more so. More angels are named uh, in the Bible than demons are. And like I mentioned before, there were people who were doing a lot of work with trying to contact and record the language of the angels. There was Edward Kelly and John Dee, famous alchemists and magicians, who, uh, who actively were striving to communicate with angels. There's the Abram Ellen ritual that was practiced by Aleister Crowley, though never finished, which the goal of the Abraham Allen ritual is to contact your guardian angel. This is a six month magical ritual, very rigorous, very uh, taxing on the body as well to contact one's guardian angel. Uh, but the study of angels themselves, there are different roles throughout history, their, their nature, as opposed to their office. Angel is not their nature. Angel is their office. So their nature is that of a celestial being of something we really can't understand. It's their, you know, angel is their job, but it's not what they are. And what they are is a mystery because they take many different forms. You know, you've got your seraphim that are almost like snakes with six set of wings, you know, or uh, your cherubs that attend the throne of God. You know, these various different ideas of how the hierarchy of heaven works. And, uh, it's, it's interesting enough that it's, it's developed during the Middle Ages and it, it reflects the ideas of the Middle Ages. Everybody's a prince or a duke. You know, they, their offices relate to the idea of uh, earthly offices that people held, you know, as nobility. And there's a whole council of heaven, too. I've done a short video on this, you know, where there are all these, these figures that serve God in a grand council that are not very mentioned throughout the Bible. I mean, there's, I think there's one mention of them in there, the council of heaven. And uh, it's just a fascinating idea to consider this assembly that stands before the throne of God and, and, and who knows what they debate and who knows what they discuss and who knows how that relates to what goes on in the world. You know, it's a very fanciful thing and it's a very ancient idea of, a, of, of Yahweh set over a, greater pantheon of gods that that may have existed in you know ancient times for the israelites before they were purely monotheists you did a show recently on antarctica and fallen angels now mm -hmm. antarctica is a continent that is so mysterious and has some interesting links with ufos and ancient civilizations can you share with us some of your knowledge about the continent and how it connects to fallen angels? Oh, I'd love to. Now, I did a video uh, years back uh, when Antarctica was Antarctica was a very hot topic back in 2015 and 16, and it really helped to build my channel at that time. Uh, but I did a video regarding the idea that Antarctica is believed by some to have been flash frozen in an instant. Not over the course of millennia, not because of climate change, but because of nothing less than the flood of Noah washing a bunch of giants down there and then freezing them in a frozen prison. All supernatural, of course. This is all supernatural. 
Uh, so the idea is that Antarctica would be the perfect prison for these Nephilim giants, the Nephilim that were never supposed to exist in the first place. Quick story, who are the Nephilim? Who are these giants? Uh, after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, you know, Adam and Eve with the apple, the, uh, there's no place for them to go. I mean, they're kicked out of the garden. They're kind of wandering around the earth. So God sends 200 angels to watch over the earth. These 200 angels say, hey, these humans, they got some pretty good looking uh, women. So we're going to take some wives for ourselves. What do you think? So these 200 angels all agree to do this. And they take human wives and have human children who are half human, half angel. And because of this celestial parentage, these children grow to be immense giants these giants populate the world. I mean, they're all over the place at this point. From from 200 angels come now their children, the Nephilim giants, and now they're all over the place. They had 1,665 years between the flood of uh, between the fall of man in the garden and the flood of Noah. So we're talking about a good 1,600 years here. Look at what we accomplished in 100. Imagine what we accomplished in 1,600 years, especially if you've got fallen angels who are teaching secrets from heaven to mankind. Secrets like how to make weapons, how to work magic, cosmetics, tinctures, root cutting, you know, all these kind of forbidden arts, these secrets of heaven were foisted upon humanity in its earliest days before they were supposed to have them. So this tells us that the fallen angels had knowledge of technology and they had supernatural knowledge of technology, which they taught mankind. So I imagine this antediluvian world populated by these giants who are not only consuming all the goods of mankind, you know, they're eating all the crops, they're eating all the livestock, now they're eating all the people. So these, these giants have now resorted to eating people, the world's in a total state of disarray, along comes the flood and washes everything away. And I think this flood was so massive and so worldwide that most of what remains from before it is buried, buried under miles of dirt, buried under the ocean, just buried and gone for good. No way to find it. Ground out to dust underneath mudslides and, and, you know, metric tons of ocean water, just gone. I mean, if you left a, a, a Pontiac sitting out in, in, a, in a flood, in a global flood, and let 6,000 years go by, there's not going to be a trace of it anymore. So if they did have advanced craft, if they did have advanced technology, I don't think anything would remain of it after that kind of flood. It would seem almost impossible. And talking about Nephilim and giants, I have recently been looking into the lore and legends of giant relic humanoid skeletons discovered in places around the world. And sometimes mm. these skeletons are taken away to museums never to be seen again. And I've also come across stories linking the giant skeletons with Bigfoot and the Nephilim. So what do you know about these giant skeletons? And why do you think so many of them that are discovered actually end up disappearing well uh the argument made by people who are proponents of this giant skeleton theory is that the smithsonian gets involved and then the bones disappear it's always the allegation that's made it's a big smithsonian cover-up since they started finding these bones but they found giant bones in the mounds in the ohio valleys and they found some giant bones in lovelock cave there are the stories from the Paiute Indians about the Setecha, who were giant red-headed giants who plagued their tribe. So there are stories that pre-exist, and there are fossils that have been found. Why cover this up? I think that there is a belief among many people that there is Darwinian science and there is scriptural history. And those two things have trouble coexisting for a lot of people. So when it comes down to it, you know, we're talking about some kind of science versus evolution debate, which has raged forever. You know, it's raged since evolution came along. It's since Darwin wrote his book. This has been a problem. But if the giants had existed, it throws 
everything in the face of evolution. You know, it's kind of like if the world was flat, everything goes in the face of, of science and astronomy. But, but that's the argument that people make. It's a biblical one. It's one that comes from a place of uh, religious belief that the giant bones are hidden to cover up the biblical truth of creation. And that's as simple as it gets, that they hide the bones so you don't know God created the world. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it boils down to that at the end of the day. You brought up the Lovelock Cave. What mm -hmm. is that story and where is it located? Uh, Lovelock Cave, I believe, was in Ohio. They were Illinois. One or the other. Lovelock Cave was in Ohio or Illinois. There were guano miners. They were, they were looking for, you know, bat guano uh, to sell for fertilizer. And they came upon Lovelock Cave and they were shoveling out of the guano. And that's when they found nine foot skeletons. And these giants were like one of the first stories that kind of surfaced in the in the in the popular media at the time. Uh, it became a sensation. So the giants of Lovelock Cave were one of the first publicly reported national news stories about giant bones being found. Uh, it was so common for them to be finding giant bones that Abraham Lincoln mentions them at a speech he gave at Niagara Falls. He talks about the giants in the mounds. What do you think about the theory that some of these giant skeletons could have been Bigfoot? I don't know. Um, this, this again, would kind of uh, point us in the direction that Bigfoot's dead or buried on purpose. And I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. But, you know, the, some of these skeletons that they found were buried on purpose. They were buried in the mounds. They were buried in the cave. They were interred there. So does Bigfoot bury its dead? Uh, maybe. Uh, are these giants Bigfoots themselves? I, I think if they were just Bigfoot, we wouldn't be dealing with such a big cover-up. I think that they were humanoid. And whether or not they were humans that existed on the same, you know, at the same time that we did or, or what, I, I do believe that they were humanoid. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that if these giant skeletons were Bigfoot, that the cover-up wouldn't be as extreme? It's easy to discredit Bigfoot. Uh, and, and if they were more animal than man, they'd be in a museum. But if they were human, if they were human giants, that's going to be part of the cover-up. But if it was a nine-foot animal, like a Gigantopithecus... That they're going to put it in a museum. They're going to tell you, hey, look, here's uh, more proof that we come from monkeys. When you put it like that, that can make more sense. Now, changing gears a little bit, something mm -hmm. that interests me is the hollow earth theory. And you yeah. know, according to some, hell is supposed to be in the center of the earth. But aside from that, it is also believed by many with books even written about the topic that the planet is actually hollow. I think the theory is really a stretch given a modern understanding of the earth's geology, crust and mantle, as well as plate tectonics and contradicts the basic understanding of how planets are created. But let's continue continue with this theory. Can you share with us your understanding and the history of the hollow earth theory? Well, hollow earth theory, I think it goes back to Kepler, if I'm not mistaken, who first kind of postulated the idea of centric, concentric circular spheres that existed within the earth. But the more modern interpretation we get of the hollow earth comes to us from a man named John Cleves Sims Jr., who lived in the 1880s. He was one who believed the entrances to the hollow earth could be found at the poles. So uh, that part of the mythology itself, the whole idea that there are entrances to the hollow earth, the North and South Pole, comes from this very man. He also spent a considerable amount of money trying to raise money for an expedition to the South Pole to try to find an entrance to the hollow earth. He contacted princes and kings, presidents and parliaments around the world trying to raise money. He sent us letters as far as his dime could go as much postage as he could pay for to try to beg money from people so he could go to the uh, South Pole and investigate the hollow earth. Now, he was never able to achieve that goal. But what he did do was go on a lecture tour around the country telling people about his hollow earth theories. 
Later on, these theories will be expanded upon and built upon. Uh, you know, they kind of get conflated with some theosophical ideas, the work of Helena P. Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, Olcott. These kind of guys would incorporate some occult ideas into the Hollow Earth mythology. So that's kind of where we get the idea that the Hollow Earth is populated by advanced beings, the, uh, the ascended masters of the theosophists. And these are all spiritually enlightened creatures that were human at some point. Some of them are immortal. Some of them are space aliens. But, uh, you know, it, it talks about a widely populated hollow earth with a central sun and a fantastic city called Agartha. Agartha is the home of the king of the hollow earth, Sanat Kumara, who comes directly from the stories of theosophy. Uh, now, Sanat Kumara would be mentioned in theosophical works, but would be really built upon by New Agers that would come later on. So uh, the, uh, the New Age itself kind of lends itself to this thing, you know, crystals and chakras, you know, that, that's all part of it at the end of the day. But uh, the hollow earth itself, a long history, we're talking about at least a couple hundred years. There was not the same understanding of geology as there is now, obviously. And there were a lot of fictional works that were passed off as true stories. Adedorfa, the smoky God, Vril, the coming race. You know, these are all stories about subterranean cultures, subterranean advanced creatures that uh, were passed off as being true stories. So in the popular mind, the idea of a hollow earth or of a subterranean world was, you know, science, it was science fiction, but it was out there in the zeitgeist for a very long time. That is so fascinating. Pete, we're coming up against another break. I have so many more questions for you, so don't go anywhere. You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? UnX Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNX DB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Howdy folks, this is Lou Elizondo and you are listening to my very good friend Christina Gomez on Shifting the Paradigm. Hi folks, these uncertain times can cause uncertain gut slowdown. Worry and fear can wreak havoc on our digestion, making it hard to feel optimum. Bloating, less energy, and occasional constipation can slow you down in your daily activity. Try Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea can help get things moving so you can get that boost of energy you need. Life Change Tea helps protect and defend your health from intruders. It's a weird time right now with all the uncertainty, so gear up and defend your health. Where do you go to purchase? Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. The specials are on the front page and we have numerous supplements to help combat intruders. It's time to take charge of our health and to feel better in life. It's time to live. Again, get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com. Hi, hi. This is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new Unex Network, and you're locked on Shifting the, the paradigm. paradigm with the intrepid Christina, Christina Gomez, Gomez on, on the X. You ever notice your home doesn't smell as fresh as it used to? It's not you. As homes age, paint, and carpet, they absorb all different kinds of odors, seemingly impossible to get rid of over time. But 
the Eden Pure Thunderstorm air purifier is guaranteed to eliminate those odors. The thunderstorm sends out the OH3 molecules into the air. It seeks out those nasty smells, germs, and mold and destroys them at the source. If you're like me, maybe you have a child who suffers from allergies or asthma. It can keep those so-called trigger smells away. No expensive filters to replace. Its compact size allows you to plug it into any room of the house and go. Other purifiers can cost up to $600 for one unit. You can get several thunderstorms for a fraction of that. With the discount code Matt, you'll save an additional 10 bucks. Go to EdenPureDeals.com. Enter the discount code Matt to save $10 off their lowest sale price. Again, go to EdenPureDeals.com. That's promo code Matt. You'll get free shipping. EdenPureDeals.com. Promo code Matt. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Are you thinking about purchasing a wood-fired heating or cooking appliance but don't know where to start? The new book, Wood-Fired Heating and Cooking, will guide you through the process and make the decision much easier. Find out about wood stoves, wood-burning fireplace inserts, masonry heaters, cook stoves, brick ovens, and more. Learn about operation and maintenance, buying and storing wood, even how to make your own charcoal. A bonus section includes delicious recipes for cooking in a wood-burning oven, grill, tandoori oven, or smoker. The wise homeowner, prepper, or homesteader will have the ability to heat their home with wood when the power goes out or to save money on increasing gas bills. Wood-Fired Heating and Cooking is available at Amazon. Visit www.woodfiredpub.com for more information. That's woodfiredpub.com. This is Micah Hanks of the Micah Hanks Program right here on KUNX. And right now, you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only Christina Gomez. It's believed mostly by Eastern religions and wisdom schools that either after death or through a deep meditation that the soul or consciousness can enter the hall of the Akashic Records. What is this place and what does it contain? Well, the Akashic Records are nothing less than a record of everything that has occurred, is occurring, or will occur in the future. It contains the lives and histories of every person that has ever existed. It is the collective unconscious. It is the, the great library of the ether existing out there somewhere, uh, said to be accessible by those with the correct psychic training. I believe that uh, Edgar Casey was someone who spoke to the Akashic Records as well, himself being a well-known psychic uh, and, um, and seer in his time. But these Akashic Records, whether they exist or not, whether they are accessible or not, are a repository of all human wisdom, all human history, and all our intelligence kept in an etheric plane, accessible by meditation or by deep, profound psychic abilities. You mentioned Edgar Casey. Can you go into more detail on who this person is? Oh, Edgar Casey was the sleeping prophet. Edgar Casey was a uh, a man who lived a, about a hundred years ago as well. He uh, uh, founded the Edgar Casey Society. He was a psychic. He he would do psychic readings. They called him the sleeping prophet. He would lay down, fall into a trance. Uh, people would write him letters. He would send them back psychic advice. Uh, he was very popular in his time. Um, He's still very popular to this day. His books are very popular. His, I mean, you can check out his website. There's still a foundation that works to propagate some of his teachings. But he did thousands and thousands of psychic readings for people. He spoke to mysteries yet to still be uncovered at the Sphinx. He spoke of Atlantis, uh, and he spoke of the Akashic Records. Uh, so this was somebody that I recommend everybody look into. If you're interested in psychic ability, I think that there are people out there that really have the gift every once in a while. 
And Edward Casey, in my opinion, was one of them. What did he say about the Akashic Records? What What did he mention that other people might not know about? Uh, he spoke to their discovery, the discovery of the Akashic Records, or the ability for people to access them, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but, uh, you know, he kind of kept the idea of the Akashic Records alive uh when uh they first kind of started being developed out of theosophical ideas all of this comes from theosophy again so the western esoteric tradition owes so much to helena p blavatsky and theosophy and theosophy has kind of been spun out into a million different directions everything on a spectrum from you know uh different occult traditions to uh, esoteric practices uh, that have developed in the new age. But it is, it is fundamental to understanding, you know, the occult sciences, I think, is to have a working understanding of theosophy. So I, I highly recommend anybody who's, who's interested in these kind of things to look into theosophy, look into the theosophical society, see some of the things they believe, see how these things have influenced what has come after. I mean, everything from the Akashic records that we're talking about now to the UFO phenomenon have been influenced in some way by theosophy, the hollow earth too. You know, we're talking about Sanat Kumara being down there in, in Agartha. That's all theosophical as well. To get access to this realm of the Akashic Records, it brings me to the topic of astral projection. It's something mm -hmm. that I've tried and experimented with a lot without much success. But for my younger viewers and listeners, can you share with us what astral projection is and some of the methods that are available to be used in order to achieve that state? Well, essentially, astral projection is leaving your body. Uh, you know, the idea that you can separate your essence from your physical self and travel outside of your own corporeal body. This can be achieved through meditation. Uh, I, I don't doubt that it's possible for every person to do this. Uh, I would not want to do this personally because I'd be scared. I wouldn't be able to get back in. Now, I wouldn't want to be stuck there. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's uh, then, then what are you, a ghost? I don't even know how that works. But there, there are some good books that have been written on this kind of stuff, like Astral Projection and Remote Viewing. Uh, Ingo Swan wrote a book called Penetration about remote viewing, which is very similar to Astral Projection. Um, I think that remote viewing can't be achieved without one being able to astrally project. And can you astral project into the past and into the future and across to other worlds? Maybe. Maybe. I, I really don't know enough from firsthand experience to say, oh yeah, you can astral project anywhere. I know that there's a lot of people who are very interested in the topic and some who experiment with it, but like from my perspective, I'd just be a little afraid that I couldn't get back into my own body. <laughs> I can understand that fear. And I've read a lot of books about astral projection. And from my understanding, from what these books had stated, was that you have this cord between your astral body and your physical body. This way you can always make it back in. Is that truth? I'm not too sure. But on, on a different kind of tangent, I guess, is one country that has always caught my attention since I was a child was Egypt. The mythology and history is so rich, so incredible, and a gem in the middle of the desert. You have talked about the gods of Egypt, and there are many. So oh. let's talk about some of them. But before we do that, what do you think these gods were based off of the Egyptian descriptions? Were they just people or survivors of Atlantis? Or were they aliens or something else entirely? <clears throat> what, what has all your research led you to conclude? Well... What are the gods of Egypt? Well, it could come down to something as simple as extraterrestrials. It really could have. Is it more likely they were refugees from Atlantis? Probably. Uh, there is a, a channeled information. And I always say take channeled information with a grain of salt. Because a channeling is something I find can be manipulative. But there is a work called The Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean. 
channeled information, but interesting read nonetheless. And it speaks to a story of Thoth, the Atlantean, the priest, prophet, and king of Atlantis, escaping its destruction in the last moments of Atlantis, you know, existence. And he flies over the water to the land of the hairy barbarian called Chem, Egypt, where they are attacked. The sons of Atlantis were attacked, he says. But they were able to repel their attackers by use of their magic science. And from then on went to teach the people. And then he sent emissaries around the world to do the same thing. Thoth is a very interesting god when it comes to the Egyptians. He's the god of writing and the god of magic. Also associated with the moon. One of my personal favorites. Later on, Thoth would be taken by the Greeks and amalgamated into a character called Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great, the priest, prophet, and king. The difference is, you know, with the Egyptians... You had a society that was so old, I think they were coming out of animism. You know, their gods all have animal heads, whether they be something like the Typhonic Beast that never existed to uh, the crocodile that they were so familiar with. Then it could have gone in a simple arc from we worship the animal to we conflate the animal with an anthropomorphic humanoid sense and then give the god divinity and then worship it in that. Or could something have come in between? I don't leave it out of the realm of possibility. The Egyptians were around for a long time. They could have encountered aliens. They could have come up with their own gods. There, there could be several possibilities as to why these things existed. And of course, you get to the story of Akhenaten. And Akhenaten himself is often said to be the alien god, the alien pharaoh. You know, he had an elongated head. He had a weird pot belly. He's the father of Tutankhamun, who had his own kind of defects uh, physically. Uh, from birth. Uh, so Akhenaten, very strange, kind of brings monotheism to Egypt. Very strange character here, also associated with various UFO theories. Uh, so it, it's, is, is it all interconnected? Is it all bigger and broader and weirder? In my opinion, yes, definitely it is. But where these gods come from, I think they come from the place any other god comes from. People have contact with divinity out there in the world. You know, for Zoroaster, he was bathing in a river when an angel appeared to him. For Abraham, he was out in the desert when God showed up. For Moses, it was a burning bush. You know, people encounter divinity in different ways, but nonetheless have encountered divinity here on earth. So did that happen for the Egyptians? Were in some ways, you know, from a, from a Christian perspective, these pagan gods are viewed as demons. Each one of them a demon, you know? So were, were these pagan peoples worshiping demons, thinking them gods? Possibility exists. Or were these gods something that came out of animism, evolved through the shamanistic period, and then were anthropomorphized? into these kind of creatures that we think of when we think of the Egyptian gods. The Greeks hated the animal heads. They got rid of them. So by the time Cleopatra comes along, the Greeks were like, whoa, 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 whoa. why are there animal heads on everything? And that's why they start to conflate with their own gods, the Egyptian ones. That's why there's a Hermes Trismegistus. That's why there's a Serapis, the uh, Apsis, it was the Apsis bull was conflated with Osiris into Serapis. And they built great Serapiums to worship Serapis in. In fact, the Serapium of Alexandria used to house a large portion of the books from the Library of Alexandria after the first time they burned it down. It eventually was burned down itself as fighting between pagans and Christians would, you know, overtake the city later on in history. But, you know, it's a shame the knowledge has been lost. It really is. It's very heartbreaking what happened to that library that held so much information. And it was believed by some that it had all the information about Atlantis as well. Mm. Now, do you have a favorite Egyptian god of interest? And you already mentioned something that I'm interested in, and that is Akhenaten. And I ask this because my favorite 
Egyptian god would have to be Ra. And the reason is not for the myths of his existence, but that Akhenaten, the pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, proclaimed in his land that multiple gods shall no longer be worshipped, but instead only one should. Aten, the disc of the sun, and originally an aspect of Ra, the sun god. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that Akhenaten was could have been either an alien or have alien DNA. And that's why he's such an interesting figure when it comes to all of this. He also was had a very tall structure and, and also an elongated head, but it was always mm -hmm. covered by a hat. And the reason to why some archaeologists believe that he did have an elongated head was because a statue was made of his daughter with an abnormally large elongated head as as well. So I think that is why Ra or Aten is my favorite god because of the correlation it has with Akhenaten. But what about you? Which one is your favorite god to research? I really like Thoth. I think Thoth is, uh, and I've made a bunch of videos about Thoth, just his role as the god of writing and magic. You know, that these things were seen as kind of complementary to each other. You know, this this god who invented the art of writing things down and also had power over over the magical abilities. So uh, in my research, I found stories about different books of Thoth where people go to great lengths to kind of try and obtain these magical books and uh, and usually suffer some terrible consequence in the process. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, there's the 12 pyramids of Thoth there's the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, there's the Book of Thoth, and then there's Thoth in the role of Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great priest, prophet, and king, who's considered foundational in Western uh, alchemical tradition. He's the author of the Corpus Hermeticum. The, uh, the, the whole idea of Hermetics comes out of that work, and the Emerald Tablets of Thoth were something that even Isaac Newton attempted to translate for his own self. Where these emerald tablets have gone, I cannot tell you. But they have disappeared from the face of the earth. What we do know is that prominent people in history have attempted to translate them in the past. So perhaps they were somewhere at some point. Maybe they're in a private collection somewhere now. Who knows? But these were foundational tablets written in emerald of alchemical truths, of hermetic texts. And to discover them would be legendary to say, Hey, look, here they are. It's the Emerald tablets. They're back on display or we've, we've rediscovered them. It would be like finding the tomb of Alexander the great. Can you go into more detail on the Emerald tablets? What are they? What do they contain? Well, it's a very different. Some people will tell you it's uh, it's one thing. Other people will tell you it's another. The translations were done by various people throughout history. So, you know, you do get various different uh, interpretations. And um, as I mentioned before, the channel information that comes from, you know, Thoth the Atlantean, that's also an aspect of it too. Uh, but essentially it, it has to do with alchemy. And you got to figure alchemy is the precursor to chemistry, you know, in that regard when magic and religion and science weren't so separate, when they were all kind of one thing. So what the tablets say, I wish I could tell you. They're lost to history. Um, you know, I could pull up Isaac Newton's translation and see what he said about them. But, uh, you know, off the top of my head, uh, I'm thinking mostly of the, uh, the channeled one that tells the great story of the destruction of Atlantis and the coming of Thoth Hermes to... Uh, to Egypt so he could teach the people there, you know, set up these colonies of Atlantis. That's my favorite one, at least. I tried reading the Emerald Tablets many years ago, and I found it very difficult. I'm like, what am I reading? I don't really understand what was going on. And I was trying to find answers on the internet, and you're right, everyone had their own explanation, or at least their mm -hmm. own theory on what the emerald tablets contained and so it it really it really threw me all over the place with just such confusion it's a confusing topic but you know it's a fun one at the end of the day 
as as all of these topics are in recent times has there been one single creepy story or myth or case that you came across that just took you aback and and made you somewhat unnerved i guess i mean um out of everything you have researched what creepy topic has put more fear into you than any others you know, I, I don't do them a lot, but uh, every once in a while I'll do a true crime story. Every once in a while. But it has to have kind of like a very unnerving aspect to it. It can't just be brutal or uh, sensational, right? So I did this story about a mysterious disappearance about a woman named Dorothy Forstein. <clears throat> Dorothy Forstein had no enemies. She was married to a Philadelphia like a city comptroller. He had some position in the city government. It wasn't high ranking or anything. He had no real influence. So one night she's uh, coming home from shopping, trying to unlock her door. This is in the forties in the 1940s. And somebody jumps out and starts beating the living daylights out of her. In the process, they knock over the phone. The operator hears what's going on, sends the police and then they find her all battered and stupefied. She had no idea what happened or who her attacker was. So uh, after that, her kind of world is shattered and she's like becomes very reclusive, um, kind of staying in the house a lot. Some years go by and her life begins to return to normal. Uh, then one night, her husband's out for a city function. It's like some kind of gala or whatever. She was on the phone with a friend, gets off the phone at like nine o'clock at night. Then uh, somebody comes into the house, comes up the stairs, walks into her room, picks her up, slings her over his shoulder, walks out of the house, and they never see her again. This is all witnessed by the 12 year old daughter. Some man comes in the house. Walks right in. Door was locked, so he must have had a key. But uh, Dorothy Forstein went completely gone off the face of the earth, never to be found. There was a citywide manhunt for her. It made national news. Nobody knows who took her. Nobody knows why. There was never any ransom demand. They never found her. Uh, you know, that's a really un unnerving one. The Sodder family is another one where there was the fire and then the, uh, the children disappeared. That's another disturbing one. And that's why I don't do a lot of true crime because they do unnerve me. You know, it's it's one thing when I'm talking about Bigfoots or what cruelty an alien might dish out to somebody during an abduction experience. But it's another thing completely to examine the depth of horrors that people can go to and inflict on one another. So, uh, so when I, uh, when I keep it creepy, I kind of keep it in the world of phantasms rather than into real world crime because it's a little too unnerving for me. And we only have a few minutes left. So my last question for you is, given the countless years you have looked into the occult, secret projects, myths, and legends from around the world, how has it shifted your paradigm? How has your view changed before diving deep into this kind of research compared to present day? Well, you know, it's like I like to say. Personally, I cover a lot of topics on my program. A lot of them are very strange. A lot of them are hard to believe in. And I don't believe in 85% of the things that I discuss. I just don't. It's the 15% that I do believe in that's absolutely bananas. And it's gotten more crazy the older I get. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so the older you get, are you stating that you're believing crazier things? Oh, or... yeah. I believe the craziest things now. Like what? <clears throat> like the hollow earth, for example. I, I think there's something down there. Whether it's a honeycomb earth or whether it's truly hollow, I think there's something to be said for subterranean species of humanoids. I think that it's possible that they do exist down there. I don't know if you've ever seen a film called The Descent. That was kind of unnerving with these kind of cave dwelling people things that were living down there. Uh, very unnerving film. 
Uh, but I, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. There was the Shaver Mysteries where he talked about the Darrow and the Tarot. Could they be down there? Could there have been an advanced race of extraterrestrials who built life forms and then left them here underground with fantastic technology and then took off back into space? Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe a lot of the space alien stuff. I just eat that up with a spoon. I mean, at this point, it's like, oh, wait, really? Space aliens? Par for the course, man. Tell me more. Tell me more about the moon, man. You know? Uh, but I... Uh, you know, I really, I, I like to leave it very wide open as to what I believe in and what I don't, because that way you can always infer that I believe the same thing you do, and then we all stay friends. <laughs> and in the end, the beautiful thing about all of this is that we simply don't know the truth. So we can allow our minds to run wild, to, to feed in that imagination, and to also gain hope from these stories. For example, the hollow earth story or theory, um, it's a paradise. It, it's a beautiful location at the center of the earth. And I think that right. can give people so much hope. Pete, thank you so much for being on Shifting the Paradigm. Where can people find you on social media? Oh, thank you so much for having me. You can find me first and foremost on YouTube. I also do content for Odyssey, BitChute, and Spotify. And you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Creepy little book. Thank you so much. You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Hearing about myths and legends have a special place in my heart. I love a good story. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. Please like this video or podcast on your platform of choice and share it with those who have the same interest. Subscribe if you haven't already because there's a lot more great shows coming to you soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Thank you.